Good morning. Do welcome you. Thank you for joining us uh, this morning. This is what uh, was normally our Saturday morning Bible Optics uh, series over in the Faith Centre, but we're not there because of the coronavirus and uh, its outworkings and the advice that we have from our uh, oversight and leaders. So I'm having it here in my apartment. So welcome to part two in this series called The Armour of God. Uh, it's an important series uh, because Paul the Apostle tells us that without putting on the whole armour of God, not the part armour of God. So many times when I ask people about the armour of God, they'll name this or you know, the breastplate of righteousness or the helmet of salvation or the thing on my feet or something like that. And they'll get around to naming bits and pieces of it. But Paul is going to show us and tell us that without donning, without putting on the whole armour of God, you won't be able to withstand the systematic and methodical attacks of our enemy. And as well as that, it reminds us that we do have an enemy. A lot of times Christians just sort of have no understanding that there's an ongoing battle right now for this generation, an ongoing battle for um, the, the ability to get the gospel and share what Jesus has done in the generation, among the generation which we live. So there's an opposition to it. And, you know, a lot of times Christians spend most of their time just rubbing the lamp uh, trying to get the God to do stuff for them to make their physical life just more comfortable. And, um, and truly that's not what this Christian life is all about. Um, so we want to talk about the armor of God, what it is and how to put it on. But in order to, to grasp the, the gravity of why we need to put it on and what it is that we need to put on, we've got to, we've got to understand the enemy that we are engaging in this fight of faith, uh, in this wrestling engagement that we have to, to uh, advance the gospel and advance the kingdom of God in, in, in the world in which we live. And so that's what we're talking about. So this part two in our series, and we'll be at this for a little while yet, but let me try and introduce and maybe help you comprehend what's going on and why we should um, know and understand and put on the whole armor of God. So, um, I talked to you last week about the reality of the fact that there are two worlds and they coexist one with another. There is a spiritual world and a physical world. There's a natural world and a supernatural world. There's an eternal world and a temporal world. And it's very important that you understand and comprehend that um, because those truths help us to grasp that, that there's a, another plane, another plateau, there's another realm that is very much real. In fact, it's more real than this. Our physical world comes from the spiritual world. The spiritual world is where God dwells and he created the heavens and the earth. So this physical world came out of God. So the spiritual world is, is an eternal world and it existed before we ever existed, before this world ever existed. And this physical world that we see came from that world. This one will pass away but that other one will not pass away. So, two worlds, spiritual, physical, supernatural, natural, and one's eternal, one is temporal. I brought out this, that the spirit world, uh, it's real, but it's invisible. We can't see it in this physical realm, but it doesn't mean that it doesn't exist. This realm exists because of that spiritual realm. This is the our, our abode, the arena in which God lives. So, it's invisible, it's eternal. This physical one keeps changing all the time, but the eternal one never changes. And it was before the physical realm, as we said. It's a realm in which God dwells. This, this is God's domain, is the spiritual world. It's very, very real. It has and is tangible spiritual substance. Just because we can't see it doesn't mean it's a cloud or a fog or a wispy thing. It's not. It's very, very real, very, very tangible. Uh, heaven has streets. Heaven has trees. Heaven has, has rivers. Heaven has a city. Heaven has walls. Heaven has mansions or homes or abode. Heaven is where God is seated. Uh, God's throne is there. God sits. God stands. God has eyes. God has ears. God has hands. And God has arms. 
God listens, God speaks. I mean, all of the stuff that we look in our physical world and say, well, that's real. In the spiritual world, there is spiritual substance, and in fact, it's more real because it doesn't change, whereas this one does. But all of that is, is there too. Earth is actually a mirror image of heaven. It's a mirror image of it. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And they're, sort of, they're parallel worlds. They sort of What you see on earth is the physical outworking of what is actually in the spirit world. Um, and the reason we like trees and the reason we like streets and the reason we like shiny things and the reason we like whatever we like is because we're hardwired because we're made in the image and after the likeness of God. And that's the abode of God. That's where God dwells. God likes those things. God surrounds himself with those things. And likewise, the mirror physical image of what's in the spirit world is here on this physical earth because we are made in God's image and after God's likeness. And so it's a tangible spiritual substance. It existed before the physical realm. And the physical world came from here, this spiritual world. I took up then this physical world. It's visible. It's temporal. It will pass away. It's changing all the time. It came after the spiritual realm. It is a tangible, physical substance. And this realm is the realm in which humanity dwells. Its origin is from the spiritual arena, spiritual realm. So there are two worlds. Now, the, the reason it's important to us, the reason it's important to us more so than it is important to the, the cow in the field or the sheep on the hill, is because as human beings made in God's image and after God's likeness, we are connected to both. We are spirit beings who have a personality or a soul and we live in this physical body. And the purpose of the physical body is to allow us spirit beings to have a, an encounter and engage the physical world in which we've been given dominion and domain. And we are not physical beings trying to have a spiritual experience. We are spiritual beings having a physical experience. And so, unlike any other creature that God made here on earth, you and I are spiritual and physical. So we're connected to both realms. We're connected to both worlds. And as a result of that, it's very important what goes on in both places because they, they affect us. Both spiritual and physical arenas have an effect on us, whether we are aware of that or not. So I, I described it like this. I described it like a matrix. If any of you ever saw the movie. And the Matrix movie sort of give us the idea that there was a, a another world that coexisted with the, 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 the then aware world. That they were aware of a world, but there was another one running, coexisting parallel to the physical world in which they lived. And they just called it the Matrix. It was sort of caught between or another world existing at the same time as the one they were living in. And it's a, it's a good example because it, it does describe really what we experience. We are physical beings uh, living in a physical world, but there is running parallel to us, coexisting with us, a spiritual arena. And this spiritual arena has influence over this physical world. I, I took up the stories last week, for example, over in the book of Daniel, where Daniel was praying to God looking for um, an answer to prayer when he was asking about um, Israel and what God was going to do with Israel in the future. And God had dispatched, uh, at the moment of Daniel's prayer, he dispatched an angelic uh, messenger angel uh, called Gabriel to come and tell Daniel what was going to happen. But Daniel uh, had to wait 21 days for this particular angel to get to him with the answer. In fact, he waited 21 days. And we read in the ninth and also the 10th chapters of Daniel, how that Daniel, uh, this angel told Daniel that he was restrained, withheld from coming to Daniel with the answer because of a principality called the Prince of Persia. Now, physically, Persia were a kingdom here on earth and they had dominion in the earth. They were sort of the, the, the dominating uh, 
world entity at that time. But interestingly, Gabriel says, I had to deal with a principality that was over this, what you see in the natural, which was Persia. I dealt with the principality over Persia. And he wouldn't let me come, and it took 21 days for me to get here. And the only way I got here was that another angel, God dispatched, called Michael, who was an archangel, Michael was dispatched to engage the Prince of Persia to give me the room or the ability to come to you with the answer to your prayer. And then when he was leaving, he made the comment to Daniel, he says, I'm leaving you now and I've got to go back through the heavenly realms and I've got to engage the Prince of Persia again to get out of here. And he said, but there's another prince coming in the not too distant future called the Prince of Grisha. And as we look at world history, we see, you know, a empires arise and fall, a, like the Babylonian Empire or the Persian Empire or the Grecian Empire or the Roman Empire. And we begin to realize from the scriptures that there are principalities that are spiritual, but they have influence over physical activity here on earth. So we have the Roman Empire, and I dare say then we have a principality that rules or governs or influences that physical world from a spiritual dimension. And so we talk about this arena and how that it has direct influence over the physical world in which we live. I talked to you too and said that as we study the scriptures and, and read, and again this scripture, this Bible, is the only book on the planet that explains all this stuff to us, that reveals all that's going on out there to us. And so as we read the book, we in this realm, we talked about how the chief invisible, principalities, thrones, powers, dominions, he created all of this stuff out there. So from the scriptures, we learn that there are seraphim, there are cherubim, there are living creatures, archangel, there are messenger angels, there are ministering angels, there are fallen angels out there, there are demons, there are devils, there are spirits, there are thrones, there are dominions, there are principalities, there is power and authorities, there are the rulers of the darkness, and there are spiritual wickedness. All of these are entities, there's an order to it, there's a hierarchy in it, um, and they, in this parallel world, in this matrix, directly influence the world in which we live. Although they can't be seen, their effects can be felt. I mean, Jesus made that statement over in John, the third chapter, when he was talking to Nicodemus. And he was talking to Nicodemus about being born again and being born of the Spirit. And Nicodemus couldn't grasp that. He goes, I mean, how, do I go back into my mother's womb? Is that what you want me to do? I mean, how can you do that? And then Jesus gave him an, 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 an illustration of how, how it works. And he said, that which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. And then he started to talk about the wind. And he says, when the wind bloweth, you can't see it, but you can see the effects of the wind. When you look out, you can't see the wind, but you can see it blowing the trees. You can see it tossing stuff around on the street. You can't see the wind, but you can see the effects of it. And Jesus went on to explain to Nicodemus, that's what being born of the Spirit is like. You can't necessarily see what happened, but you can see the outwork and physical effects of it. And likewise, the spiritual world, although you can't see it, it is affecting, influencing the physical world in which we live. Like this matrix idea. Now, whether we realize it or not, and I shared this with you last week, we were being influenced by this other realm. All of us, every single one of us on the planet were being influenced by this invisible, unseen realm called the spirit world. And Paul says it and describes it this way in Ephesians, the second chapter. He says, wherein in time past, you and me, talking about us, walked according to the course of this social order, this, this, this world, according to the prince of the power of the air. He said, we walked according to the prince of the power of the air. Whether you realize it or not, we were being influenced 
This generation is being influenced by a prince that is influencing this physical world from a spiritual dimension. And we were all influenced. We all walked according to the course of this cosmos, according to the prince of the power of the air. The spirit. So again, we want, want you to see this is not a physical entity. This is a spiritual entity, a spiritual principality. The spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience or rebellion. This spirit is working on this cosmos, this system we're in, and, and any of the negative outworkings you see in it are his influence. And we were all influenced by it. The verse before it talks about how that God quickened us and made us alive again to God and basically delivered us from this influence. Ephesians 3. God's intent and purpose and plan for the church, of which I belong to, and those of you that made Jesus Lord of your life, you belong to, it says here, now God's intent, that now onto these principalities and powers, onto this other realm, in heavenly places. We're not talking about, you know, the government in, in Nicaragua or the government in Nigeria or the government in India. We're talking about principalities and powers in heavenly places. And God's intent for the church, to the intent that now onto the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be made known by the church the manifold wisdom of God. Or God's intention was that now onto these principalities and powers through us the church might be brought to bear God's wisdom and God's influence in, in that, that whole arena. God wants us to engage that arena from here. God wants us, the church, this physical entity on this physical world to engage the principalities and the powers in heavenly places and for us to bring influence to bear upon the physical world in which we live. And that is God's or part of God's intent for us, the church. So it's a very, it's a very necessary uh, understanding we've got to grasp. It's a very necessary arena that we've got to engage. If we're going to change the world, if we're going to influence the world, if we're going to reach the world, if we're going to, if we're going to, and touch that generation that we live in, this is an arena that we've got to go to to bring influence to bear, and that influence in that arena will influence the physical world in which we live. Because, as we say, the people in this world are being influenced by this spirit, this prince, a palatine, this prince of the air. Now, Jesus was very aware of this, and I explained this last week, how that when Jesus came into the world, they thought... He was the Messiah to come in and deliver them from Rome. But again, if you understand my, the connotation of what we've been talking about this morning, there was a principality that was over that. There was a spirit working in the world. There was a spirit bringing influence to bear in the world. It's a spirit that brought the influence of sin into the world. Sin was not something that happened here, that came from here. Sin entered into the world. The Bible says in Romans, the fifth chapter, the 13th verse, as you read through, it talks about how that sin entered into the world through Adam. Adam allowed it to come in. It wasn't from here. It, it wasn't a physical thing. It actually sin is a spiritual thing. And, and it entered into the world through Adam because Adam was given dominion and authority. When Adam yielded to this principality, that principality's influence was brought to bear upon Adam, and Adam, who was given dominion of the world, authority over the world, now Adam, being under the influence of that principality, started to outwork that influence into the world. And so people look around and say, you know, how could God do this and God do that? Well, that's not necessarily true, that God's doing this and God's doing that. Mankind, under the influence of this other arena, this these principalities and powers and might, spiritual wickedness and high places, the rulers of the darkness of this world, that's really what's operating. And although people can't physically see it, they, they want to blame somebody to see the effects of it, but they don't know what's influencing it. 
But as born-again believers and from the Word of God, we get insight into what's happened. So Jesus was very aware. They all thought he was coming to deliver them from a physical Roman Empire, but Jesus wasn't even... Jesus loved the Roman Empire. He loved Caesar. He loved his enemies. They weren't his problem. The problem was this individual here. And Jesus addresses him, and I'm sure the, the disciples at the time were sort of wondering, what is he talking about? It's not until the New Testament that we get a fuller revelation of all of this. Revelation is progressive. As you start back in the book of Genesis and work your way through the book, you get more and more and more understanding, revelation, insight, optic on what's going on. And Jesus was the one, being God in flesh, that give us the full um, a, a visual of what's going on between these two worlds and Jesus made these statements he says now is the judgment of this world or social order now shall the prince of this social order be cast out now remember this he's not the prince of the world he's the prince of the social order that's in the world Psalm 115 tells us I think it's verse 25 thereabouts and um, the the earth is God's the earth is the Lord's but the stewardship of it he give to man so the devil doesn't own the world in fact Adam doesn't own the world Adam had a stewardship over it and because Adam came under the influence of this principality this principality set up the the social order through Adam so it says here now is the judgment of this social order it's the word cosmos now shall the prince of this cosmos be cast out Again, in chapter 14 and verse 30, Jesus addresses him again. Hereafter, I will not talk much with you, for the prince of this social order cometh and hath nothing in me. Can't find an opportunity to take me out. And in chapter 16, again, Jesus addresses this entity, this influence that's going on, that others can't see because it's invisible, but it's real in that it's it's influencing the physical world. In John 16, 11, of judgment because the prince of this social order is judged. Jesus was very aware of this individual. So, my question is, who is this prince of the world? Now, for many, you know, they, they don't even want to believe this. They want to believe that, you know, we evolved from a blob, we come out of a soup in the ocean, and we... we went up into trees and we, if we didn't fly we became primates or whatever and we've evolved into the species that we are today and they don't even want to admit there's another world there's another realm there's another arena and they don't want to believe that there is a prince over this world and man is the is the um, is the reason for the way the world totally is the reason for the way the world is today and that's not true and and we know this not to be that way because the scriptures unfold to us what this world is about and how this comes about and this individual here the prince of this social order or the the system that we see on the earth at the moment there's a principality that runs it an individual and I'm going to talk about him so we'll understand our enemy a little better now most people when they talk about the devil or uh, Satan this is the this is the image that people want you to think or because we think of evil and badness and all that is wrong and all that is corrupt and, 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 and so we just have this real ugly, ugly, ugly image and, and this is what we come to. This is, this is him. He's so ugly. I mean, sin is so ugly. Evil is so ugly. This is what he looks like. How ugly. Or, well, I, I didn't even go to that so quickly. But this is actually what he is. Satan is an anointed cherub. A gorgeous, beautiful. In fact, he's probably, well, not even probably, he's the most beautiful creature God ever made. He, he's, he's fantastically beautiful. He doesn't look like that. Not at all. He's nothing like that. He's like this. He is a, an angel of of light he is a an anointed cherub at least he was but he's a cherub he's a cherubim and the word cherub 
means burning one. Uh, and it's all got to do with the fact that they're in the presence of God. And when you're in God's presence, who radiates light, uh, when it says in the book of Revelation that when there's a new heaven and a new earth, there will be no need for the sun. When the new Jerusalem comes and sits on the earth, that the brightness of God's presence will illuminate the whole earth and the whole universe. And there will be no need for the sun. So, I mean, there are a lot of changes coming uh, in the physics of what we call uh, the universe. And one of them is that the brightness uh, of God is going to illuminate the, the earth. Then we won't need the sun. There will be no sun in the new heaven and the new earth because God's uh, brightness will illuminate it. So anybody in the presence of God becomes the bearer of that radiance, becomes the bearer of that glory, becomes the bearer of that illumination. Another example. In the book of Corinthians, and it talks of, about a, an instance where Moses went up and spent 40 days in the presence of God, where he was receiving the Ten Commandments. And he went up into the Mount uh, in Sinai, and he disappeared off into the thundering and lightnings, and was gone for 40 days. And it tells us, both in the book of Exodus, and it tells us in the book of Corinthians, Paul referring to it, and the glory of what... Moses went through, when Moses came out of the presence of God and came back down to the people, the, 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 the narrative explains to us or tells us that Moses, was his face was so bright, his, his countenance and his radiance was so bright to look at that they had to put a veil over Moses' face. That's how bright, that's that's how radiant Moses became when he stood in the presence of God for those 40 days. It affected him. It, it, it transferred to him and he was radiant with light and glory. When Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration in the book of Matthew, when he uh, uh, transfigures in front of Peter, James and John, and the Bible explains that he radiates brighter than the sun in all its brilliance. And that's when Moses and Elijah showed up to talk with Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration. So there's a brightness, there's a, an illumination, there's a glory. And the word cherub, and, and actually the word seraph, because the seraphim were there. Seraphim, the word seraphim means burning ones. I mean, they're ablaze. It's, it, it's just, it's the only way to describe it. They're so luminous, they're so radiant, they're so bright, um, that, that it's, it's brighter than the sun in all its brilliance. And so this individual that, that we think is this, he's not that at all, he's this. He is not an anointed cherub, in fact, he's called the anointed cherub, which means there was only one of him, and he had a very peculiar, particular um, position. Unlike other cherubs and unlike other seraphim, he was the, not a, the only anointed, creative cherub. God had given him creative uh, opportunity. And so he was called the anointed cherub. So let's, let's read a little bit about him. We're introduced to him. Uh, throughout the scriptures in different forms. So just let me pull it together some of the detail about this individual. Ezekiel, the 28th chapter. Um, Ezekiel, the prophet, is prophesying to, the, the, to a physical prince called the Prince of Tyrus. And he prophesies to him by the Spirit of God. He talks about se several things uh, that would, would happen uh, uh, to the life of and because of the life of this particular prince, physical prince of Tyrus. And then as he's prophesying, the, the, the prophecy changes its tone. And the prophet Ezekiel starts to prophesy no longer to the prince of Tyrus, but to the king of Tyrus. And there was no king at this particular time. There was just the prince of Tyrus. But the king of Tyrus here that he's talking about, we begin to see, is not the physical king of Tyrus, 
because he starts to talk about his vocation and his his purpose and his luck and whatever and begin to realize he's not talking about a physical king of Tyrus he's talking about a principality and so this is this is the change of of uh, emphasis as as he f is prophesying to the prince of Tyrus and then all of a sudden here in verse 12 he changes it over and he addresses the principality that is influencing this physical king and we get to see who he is Ezekiel the 28th uh, chapter and the 12th verse it says son of man take up this lamentation upon the king of Tyrus sounds okay for now say unto him thus said the Lord you seal up the sum of wisdom sorry you see you seal up the sum full of wisdom perfect in beauty okay the scriptures tell us here that this individual is full of wisdom I mean smart I mean intelligent I mean highly intelligent full of wisdom and perfect absolutely perfect when it comes to beauty when it comes to gorgeousness if there is such a word this individual is as beautiful as is as is beauty he he seals up he's the he's the sum total of he's the fullness I mean if you want to see beauty you know what beauty is or beauty looks like this individual is that thou hast been in Eden now here's where we get the here's how we know that it's not the the king of Tyrus it's not a physical person because the only two physical people that were ever in Eden was Adam and Eve and after they sinned they were they were driven from the garden and two cherubim were put in there in, in Genesis the third chapter to stop any other human being ever going back in there to participate of the tree of life the only other entity we know that was in the garden of Eden was Satan this individual that seals up the sum of wisdom and beauty this individual resided in Eden so we talk about it you have been in Eden the garden of God every precious stone was your covering or your adornment the topaz sorry the sardis the topaz the diamond the barrel the onyx the jasper the sapphire the emerald the carbuncle the gold the workmanship of your tablets and of thy pipes was prepared in thee in the day that thou was created again he's speaking to an entity that is made up of all of these beautiful stones and 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 jewels and diamonds and 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 jaspers and sapphires and emeralds and carbuncles and and sardis and to I mean the colors that are in this individual and he's made up from this stuff the only other time these stones these jewels these diamonds are mentioned in the Word of God is when um, they made the ephod for the, the uh, high priest in Israel and there was 12 stones to represent the 12 tribes of Israel and each one of these particular stones were used to describe the breastplate or how it was made up and again it was a spectacular uh, garment to look at had all of these jewels and diamonds and precious stones in it and the other time it's used is over in the book of Revelation when it talks about the city of Jerusalem and the foundations of that city and all of these again precious stones and beautiful stones and colors and are, are all used to describe that foundation well this individual is made up of those things he's made up of jewels he's made up of, of sapphires he's made up of diamonds he's made up of of emeralds he's made up of all of these stones I, I can't imagine what that looks like but that's what he's made from whereas man was made from the dust of the earth to give us a physical body this particular individual is made from all of these stones and the workmanship of your tablets and of your pipes and many commentators tell us that this individual had percussion and wind instruments he was he, he was a musical orchestra 
he, he had this ability. His tablets and his pipes were prepared in him the, the day that he was created. So a lot of commentaries would, would lean to the fact that this individual, this cherub, and this, and this beautiful um, creature had the ability to lead song, create song and worship. And again, let me say this to you too. Music is spiritual. It's why people, when they talk about music, they think, you know, music is the global language. It, it, it transcends all cultures and, and all geography. So there are songs kids sing today that, that go global. And why are we drawn to music? Why do we have so much music? Why is there so much influence through music? It's because music is a spiritual thing. And, and God created this creature to, to lead it, to, to create it, to, um, to perform it. And um, this creature was built like that. Let me move on. Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth. And again, he's not called an anointed cherub. He's called the anointed cherub that covereth. And I have set thee so. You, you are on the holy mountain of God. You walk up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. This is this brightness. This is this glory. This is this radiance that comes from this individual because of his close proximity to the very presence of the Godhead. In fact, after the Godhead, this is the next elevated creature. This is the highest elevated creature in that arena. And he walked up and down in the midst of that presence, that brightness, that glory, that radiance, that illumination that is God. You were perfect in your ways in the day that you were created until iniquity was found in you. This individual was perfect full of wisdom, full of beauty, and walked right in the presence of, and ministered to, and ministered in the presence of Almighty God, the Godhead. By the multitude of your merchandising, or your business, and we'll explain all this later, by the multitude of your merchandise, they have filled the midst of thee with violence, and you have sinned. Therefore, I will cast you as profane out of the mount or the mountain of God. And I will destroy thee, O covering cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. Your heart was lifted up because of your beauty. And you have corrupted your wisdom by reason of your brightness. I will cast thee to the ground. I will lay thee before kings and they will behold you. That there's, there's a fall of this individual because he's so intelligent, so smart, so beautiful, so wise, and he got proud. He, he, he thought he was something. He, he, he elevated himself. Um, or as we say uh, in, in today's language, he, he sort of, he started to operate above his pay grade. And uh, started to think things about himself that were really reserved for God and he started to corrupt what he was and corrupt what he was doing and it was something because he was an anointed cherub he had the ability to create and this is where sin comes from he's going to it's going to come out of him uh, because of, of his anointing his privilege to 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 create to do stuff at the at juncture you have defiled your sanctuaries or your abode by the multitude of your iniquity, by the iniquity of your traffic or your merchandising or your, um, he, we're going to find out this guy set up a social order um, and, and he, he perverted it. He, he got it all wrong. He, he, he had the authority over it, but he, because of his pride, he, he corrupted it. He manipulated it and corrupted the whole thing. Therefore, I will bring, uh, and the reason I highlighted this one here in blue is because I want you to see this. He says, I will, God is speaking to him prophetically, I will bring forth a fire from the midst of thee, and it shall devour thee, and I will bring thee to ashes upon the earth in the sight of all them that behold thee. And they that know thee among the people shall be astonished at you, and you shall be a terror and never shalt thou be anymore. I highlighted this because 
people many times ask, where does hell come from? And, you know, if God is such a good God, why did God create hell? Well, it, it's not God. I, I put these scriptures down here. Do not err, James said, my beloved brethren. Every good and perfect gift comes down from above. It's from above. Comes down from the Father of light, that's that illumination, with whom there is no variableness and no shadow of turning. There's no shady parts of God. What you see is what you get. What, what he says is what he is. And only good and perfect gifts come from God. So where did hell come from? Well, hell says, I will bring forth a fi fire from the midst of you. So you're talking to this cherub. You're talking to this uh, fallen cherub uh, uh, of which iniquity has rose up within him. He said, well, I'll bring it out of you, and out of you I will create a fire, and that fire will devour you. And here he describes it this way in Matthew 25, while Jesus is speaking here, says, Then shall the say also unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, that's this here, this fire here, into everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. So that's, that's, that's where all that came from. And God only does good things. Every good and perfect gift comes from God. So this cherub, this entity, uh, obviously was in Eden. This entity uh, re resided in Eden. He had um, a responsibility in Eden. Eden obviously was down here. Heaven was up there. So at some stage in his creation, and some stage in his administration, <clears throat> he was down here. And he had an, a social order. He was merchandising and trafficking. And they were doing business. There was some form of, of order here on, on earth, this Garden of Eden. And he operated out of there, but for some reason perverted his, his purpose. And iniquity was birthed or discovered in him. And it was to be his demise, because God was going to deal with him. Now... <clears throat> This individual is an angel of light. He is incredibly beautiful, incredibly wise, and he is incredibly bright. Here he is here. He says in Isaiah chapter 14, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer? The word there, Lucifer, means light bearer. He isn't light. Like in the beginning uh, of the Gospel of John, it says, uh, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and, and the Word was God. And it was on to say that He is the light uh, that illuminates all men, and He is the light of the world, Jesus said of Himself. This individual is not the light, He is a light bearer. That's what the word Lucifer means. How art thou fallen from heaven? This is an individual that was called the light bearer, and that fell. That had a demise. He fell from uh, his position in the heavenlies. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? He is not, as people mistake, over in Revelation 22, 16, it talks about Jesus being the bright and morning star. Um, Jesus is the bright and morning star. This individual is son of the morning. He's a created individual. And he's a light bearer. And again, this... this um, leans into that whole fact that he walked up and down in the very presence of God and he's made up of all of these uh, luminous uh, jewels and, and, and precious stones. So, how art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which did weaken the nations? I'll bring this up again. For thou hast said in your heart, this is where this event happened, I will ascend into heaven, I will exalt my throne, so he had one, above the stars of God, which are angels. I will sit also on the mount of the congregation, in the sides of the north. He's talking about taking over God's throne. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds, which implies he was below them. So obviously he was going to ascend, he was going to go from here to there. He was in Eden, he had a... A, a culture, he had a cosmos, a social order that was here. He was running it, he perverted it, 
became proud and decided I'm going to lead a rebellion, I'm going to go back up there, I can do just as good a job as God can, I'm so wise, I'm so gorgeous, and I'm so much in charge. And he led this rebellion against God, and, and God stopped it. That's why in, in the Ezekiel portion we read, God says, I will do this, and I will do this, and I will do this to you, because here's, he, he puts in five I wills in this portion, and God in the book of Ezekiel, as he prophesies, gives him five, well, I will do this. And, and of course, what God said he would do is far greater than what this individual thought he could do. I will ascend into heaven, I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit on the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north, and I will ascend above the heights of the clouds, and I will be like the Most High. Jesus refers to this event over from the book of Ezekiel and also from the book of Isaiah. And Jesus, when the disciples came back, and they were astonished when, Jesus, when they came to Jesus because devils and demons were responding to the authority of the name of Jesus. And Jesus uh, says this, And the seventy returned again with joy. They came back to Jesus as he had sent them forth to go into the, the, the villages and towns and, and share the gospel that the kingdom was at hand. And the seventy returned again with joy, saying, Lord, even the devils are subject unto us through your name. And he said unto them, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. Now notice the name change. He, he was called Lucifer, which was light bearer, and his name changes to Satan, which means fallen one. And Jesus again being the second member of the Godhead, here, here he is God in flesh, but he makes this comment. I, I beheld, I was there the day he got kicked out, the day he was demoted, the day he was uh, exiled from heaven to earth. And it was like lightning. I mean, it was as fast as, as a lightning bolt. I mean, he led this rebellion against the Almighty. He got puffed up in his pride, his wisdom, his beauty. He was running a social order here on earth out of the Garden of Eden. He led this rebellion, and as quick as a bolt of lightning, God stopped it and cast him out. Jesus said, I was there. I saw it when it happened. And he said unto them, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. I was there for that event. So, this entity, this creature, this anointed cherub, um, lost his position, lost his role, lost his title, lost his stewardship, lost his position, and got cast down to the earth. His name is changed from light bearer to fallen one, which is the word Satan, that's what it means. And if we read the book of Genesis at the introduction of humanity, of Adam and Eve into the same garden, the Garden of Eden, this entity, his name at this juncture, when Adam and Eve show up in Genesis chapter 3, this entity is not called Lucifer, the anointed cherub, the light bearer. His name is called Satan, which implies that this entity had already gone through this whole process. He had already and once operated out of the same garden that Adam and Eve are in. And he now, um, when they see him, he is at this juncture uh, the fallen one. So all this other stuff of Lucifer and these, his merchandising and trafficking and his, his cosmos and all of that stuff was prior to Adam and Eve. Because when Adam and Eve engage him, he's already this fallen from his position cherub. He's called Satan. All of this other stuff I read to you was when he was called Lucifer, when he was that anointed cherub. Now, is this what Adam and Eve saw? Well, no, they didn't. They didn't. Is this what Adam and Eve saw? Because a lot of times people think, you know, this is this is the devil. You know, he's got horns and a and a fork and whatever. And believe me, that he is not like that either. He's not like either of these. Or maybe he's this. Maybe he's a serpent or a snake. 
And no, he's not. He wasn't even that. That's not what they saw. They didn't see a snake talking to them. They saw this. They saw that illuminated, beautiful, gorgeous, awesome entity and that is that is radiant, that is bright, that is made up of all of these gorgeous and precious stones. This this entity is perfect in beauty. And he radiates. He's the light bearer. He radiates light. And this is what they saw in in the Garden of Eden. And I, I'll try and bring this up next week and talk to you about uh, did they engage a snake or did they engage this entity here? Well, they, they engaged this entity here. They, they were quite impressed by what they saw in, in Satan, this fallen cherub. And um, he, he, um, he is a spiritual dignitary. Um, whether you realize it or not, even though he is a fallen cherub, by creation he is a spiritual dignitary. He carries a lot of influence and weight in the spiritual arena. When we talked about seraphim and cherubim and living creatures and, and this hierarchy and, 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 and these entities in that matrix, that spiritual world that runs next to ours, this creature is a spiritual dignitary. And we've got to understand this. A lot of times we're very flippant when we talk about this individual. We're very flippant in our in our uh, perception, our concept of who he is, and we know he's. I mean, we understand he's fallen. We understand he's a defeated foe. We understand that Jesus lords over him, but he is a formidable enemy. In fact, it took God faith. I mean, the Bible says this. The Bible says that God created the universe. And describes the, the, the creating of the universe as the work of his fingers. God just was, it was just so easy for God to create. He just spoke it into existence. And, and the world was that, the universe was just the work of his fingers. Boom. Effortless. Boom. The Bible says our redemption Winning humanity back to himself was the work of his arm. It took more strength, more intent, more resistance, more effort on God's behalf to win us back than it did to create the universe. Why? Because of this. Because of this entity here. And we've got to we're not afraid of him, but we've got to understand our enemy. And you can tell a lot of times that believers don't understand who they're dealing with, what they're dealing with, because of the way in which we address the issue. And because we don't understand it right, we, we don't prepare ourselves to engage what's going on correctly. In Jude, here when Michael the Archangel comes down to contend with this character, over the body of Moses. Likewise, and I, 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 in Jude here, uh, Jude is speaking also about how the people don't understand what they're dealing with. And he, he, the book of Jude is about that. People who are diverse, not having the full comprehension of what they're doing and why they do what they do. And Jude describes this here. It says, Likewise, also these filthy dreamers defile the flesh. They despise authority. They despise dominion. They despise government. They despise the order of things. And, and he's talking about wicked people. And they have no idea. They just despise everything that has order to it. And they speak evil of dignities or dignitaries. They, 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 they sort of fob them off as nothing. He says, you don't understand who you're talking about. You don't understand what you're talking about. 
just fob them off. And in many times people talk about the president or they talk about you know, people in authority. You have no idea until you put your behind on the chair and your feet in under the desk. You have no idea the weight of, of responsibility and the decision making and the effect of those decisions, right or wrong. Many times we can sit in the in the bleachers and make comments and oh yeah yeah or we go to a baseball match or a football match and we comment so easy why didn't you do this why didn't you do that oh you stupid individual and we comment so flippantly so easily from the grandstand but it's a different thing when you're on the field it's a different thing when you're in the game and basically what he's going to try and say here is if you're not in the game if you're not engaging this entity and, and what's going on, you, you, you show that you, you don't understand. You show that you're ignorant of what's going on by the manner in which you talk about and treat the whole process. And so a lot of times Christians sit in the bleachers, read the book and say, ah, yeah, that's only slew's foot. That's only, you know, the devil with the pitchfork. That's only that ugly, grotesque, gargoyle type creature and he's nothing like that. Or it, just, it just shows the ignorance uh, of, of, of us as believers not understanding who we're engaging, why we're engaging him and why we need the whole of our God. We're told that we need this to wrestle against and to engage this arena. We need this armor for that reason and most Christians don't even know what the armor is. They can't even name it all. Why? Because they don't wear it all. Why? Because they have no idea what's going on and they don't even know who they're dealing with. Likewise, also these filthy dreamers defile the flesh, they despise dominion, they speak evil of dignitaries, yet Michael the archangel, when contending with the devil, here's this entity, Lucifer, or Satan as he's now. Michael the Archangel, remember this guy that engaged the, the Prince of Persia to, to let Gabriel come through, this warring angel? Yet Michael the Archangel, when contending with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses. So he, he, he sent down to deal with this issue. It says, he did not bring against him a railing accusation. He didn't come down and and meet Satan and say, hey you, you, hey, off you go, go on, get out, go on. He understood, being an archangel, that this entity, this cherub, is a dignitary when it comes to spiritual authority. He, he's, he's, he's a dignitary, he's a VIP in that arena. And he didn't bring a railing accusation. He didn't come around and tell him, hey, you've fallen one. He understood the order. He understood, he understood what was going on. He understood the, the level of creation and, and, and investment in this individual. And Michael understood his position when it came to dealing with this creature. He didn't bring a railing accusation against him, but said, the Lord rebuke you. Hey, I'm not down here to fight you, pal. You're bigger, stronger, better maybe than me. But I, I, I'm down here. He said, you've got to let this body go. The Lord rebuked thee. But these speak evil of those things which they know not. But what they know naturally as brute beasts, in those things they corrupt themselves. And he's talking to these people. He said, Michael wouldn't even, Michael wouldn't even speak to this creature on that level. But you can tell people are so ignorant because they speak evil of stuff they know nothing about. Also over here, Peter talks about false teachers. And, and again, they're speaking and teaching about stuff and you can tell their ignorance because they don't understand what they're dealing with and they speak wrong about dignitaries. And he's talking about Satan and all of these characters. Think that they're, you know, they're a pushover and God wouldn't give you armor if they were as easy to push over. There's a war going on. There's a, there's a fight of faith. There's a wrestling against, not flesh and blood, but against principalities. There's an engagement of which it requires we, the church, 
as we show on to the principalities and powers the wisdom of God, we need to have the armor of God on to engage these individuals. But chiefly then, that walk after the flesh. He's talking about false teachers. That walk after the flesh in the lust of uncleanness. They despise and despise government, authority, rank. Presumptuous are they. Self-willed. They are not afraid to speak evil of dignities. And again, he's talking about false teachers. Presumptuous, self-willed, and, and, and ignorant. And they speak of these dignitaries flippantly. Verse 11. Whereas angels, which are greater in power and might, bring not railing accusation against them before the Lord. He said, I'm telling you. Some people down here just speak like nothing. And, and when they speak like that and talk like that and fob them off like that, it's obvious you don't understand what you're talking about. When you get into that arena, when you get into that realm, angels who are mighty, they're awesome creatures. There's not an angel will speak that way. They will, they will, they will bring railing, unnecessary, undue accusation against these creatures. Because they understand the rank of them and they understand the order of them. And they treat them like dignitaries. But these false teachers, as natural brute beasts, made to be taken and destroyed, speak evil of things that they understand not, and shall utterly perish in their own corruption. There are so many in the body of Christ who don't understand what, what, what's going on, don't understand what we've got to do, and don't understand how to do it. And in order to make a difference in this world and to bring influence to bear in this world for the kingdom of God, you and I have got to engage this arena because this arena, the spiritual arena, influences this physical world. For us to go out there into that arena, which we have a right to do because we, we're connected to both, we've got to adorn ourselves or dress ourselves correctly for the engagement to influence, to bring authority to bear to step into that arena and deal with principalities that are having influences in the air. You and I have got to be dressed accordingly and appropriately. And one of the things we've got to do is understand what we're dealing with. He said there's a lot of false teachers and a lot of people who show their ignorance by speaking flippantly about these things and it only reveals their ignorance of these things. And so um, that's what we're going to talk about the next time we're together. Thank you for being with us this morning. Please join us, if you would, on Tuesday morning um, as we're dealing with freedom. And again, next Thursday evening um, as we do another series on limiting God. Again, thank you for being with us this morning. Let me pray with you and let me let you go. Father, we thank you for your word this morning. Thank you for the revelation of these two worlds, spiritual and natural. And I pray, God, that as we study as we come to understand what's going on and what needs to go on that we would prepare ourselves adorn ourselves and take advantage of what was given to us that we might bring influence to bear in the world in which we live and advance your kingdom in jesus name and everyone out there that hasn't got a sore neck said amen thank you for taking time to be with me this morning